history one. Uh, we're going to be starting here with the beginnings of a human civilization. And there's a sort of a long list of terms that I've got for you, but uh, we'll get through these as quickly as we can. I uh, won't necessarily touch on every last one, but we're going to hit some interesting high points as we go from no civilization uh, to a civilization uh, today with this first series. So to start with uncivilization, we've got to start with non-humans, right? Uh, <clears throat> when we talk about the rise of humanity, nobody is really 100% sure uh, of what we're talking about. A number of scientific theories that sort of debate each other. Uh, you get uh, <clears throat> sort of proto-hominids like the Dryopithecus that spread out all over the world, uh, eventually giving uh, possibly rise to a different genus, Australopithecus, in southern and eastern Africa. Uh, a lot of people who are in the anthropology and in the, uh, the, the scientific, the, you know, the bioscientific fields uh, point to actually uh, not the de development of the human brain, uh, but to the locking knee for physical development. Now, for us, when we talk about the rise of civilization, we're actually much more interested in uh, the brain uh, as far as development. When we talk about technology, we've got to talk about Australopithecus. Uh, the forests are, are eventually going to give way to much more open grassland when we talk about changes across several millennia, whether we're talking about 4 million years ago until about 1.5 million years ago or so, we're going to see some climate change that takes place on planet Earth. Nobody tell or that the Earth changes its climate all by itself because it totally does. But uh, this is what's going to happen here. Now, the Australopithecus is a pretty well-adapted little hominid because it can walk upright and carry items or carry its young or carry tools. We're also going to see that this is the beginning of what we call the Stone Age. Uh, this is often referred to in Greek as the Paleolithic, or paleo meaning old, and the lithic meaning stone, uh, ages. And so we've got evidence of the use of crude stone, bone, and wood tools, and if a really sort of forward-thinking uh, sci-fi kind of person might say, oh, it's the beginning of the cyborgs, right? And it is. It's the beginning of you know, the use of technology uh, by flesh and blood creatures, right? <clears throat> the first uh, of the genus that, that you and I have is going to be, at least of what we've discovered, is Homo erectus, right? It's a name for the ability to walk completely upright, so you get this upright walking kind of position. And we're also going to see that during the period of the fossil record that we have for Homo erectus, a much more varied style of stone tools. More importantly, we're going to see the systematic use of fire is going to be key. So all of a sudden, instead of just finding places where fire may or may not have been prevalent, it looks like these guys not only could uh, control the use of fire, but even create it. Uh, on purpose. And of course, that radically changes everything, not only in terms of diet, but in terms of protection, light, heat, etc., etc. Now, these guys are going to emerge something like 1.5 million years ago, and they're going to leave Africa and they're going to colonize Europe and Asia. We're also going to see that the, a pretty uh, accurate term to use for these guys would be cavemen, cave women, right? Cave people uh, for this, uh, because they tend to live in caves for uh, shelter. <clears throat> now, we take an interesting either parallel track or side track, depending on your viewpoint on where these guys fit in, and that's the, the uh, Homo neanderthalus, or Homo sapien neanderthalus, depending on how you want to view this. About 250,000 years ago, okay, we're going to see that this sort of Homo sapien-like people, right, they appear in Africa. It's the first subspecies of Homo sapien, at least according to some in the scientific community, and you're going to find them in the fossil record from about 250,000 years ago until about 30,000 years ago. Now, they're less skilled than the later Cro-Magnons, but they're still pretty effective little colonizers, and they're going to be going out, and they're going to uh, find them in Europe and in the Middle East. Now, these guys, it turns out to be pretty well adapted for what is taking place climatically, which is a series of ice ages that are going to grip uh, Europe. We're also going to find our first evidence of human religious practices with the burial of their dead, and some seem to have set up some pretty elaborate worship sites in their cave. You can find here in the photos uh, some <clears throat> depictions of what they may uh, look like. This is one on the bottom left here of a Neanderthal with all of its sort of uh, hair stripped away to give you an idea of their skull structure. Uh, this is, <clears throat> and it looks, it looks pretty weird, you know, you might look at a guy like that if you saw him, say, on a bus or something. Whoa, you know? But there's a, a child, and you would look at that and go, eh, it looks like a kid. Something maybe a little different, but nothing too crazy. And so I like the artist's rendition here of Ice Age Europe. These guys are all out on the step. You've got the wild animals, you know, the buffalo and the woolly mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers, and I have no idea if all of those animals inhabited the same place at the same time. But why not, right? And now you've got their uh, semi-sewn layers of uh, animal pelt clothing, good resistance against the cold, they're out there cooking their meal, and of course, 
Looks like these guys are pointing out a shooting star that's about to flatten them all. Sad. Anyway, <clears throat> when we get to the first anatomically modern humans, they're given this name, the Cro-Magnon uh, of this. And essentially, they're, they're, they're you and I. And we start seeing this in the fossil record somewhere around 200,000 years ago or so uh, in Africa. They're going to spread out of Africa by about 100,000 years ago, and very, very quickly, at least in uh, biological terms, they're going to colonize pretty much the entire world, minus Antarctica, by about 4,500 uh, years ago. So <clears throat> you'll also see the transition uh, here into a much more variegated stone tool used with uh, rebar, bifacially worked flint, and uh, needles for sewing. Uh, so you'll see these guys you know, the wearing trousers and pants and things like that. Uh, cave art is going to become a lot more prevalent uh, with these people. When we get into this period where we've got the Neolithic, all right, so we get the Neo, New, Lithic, is, it's a new stone age, it's a radical change in terms of technology, we're going to see some major shifts uh, that have taken place. One of the major ones, uh, really, for all of human history is the domestication of both plants and animals. Uh, most people in the scientific community uh, think that domestication begins probably with the dog in the Mesolithic, but then as you extrapolate outward and say, well, if we can domesticate wolves into dogs, then what else can we domesticate that will live near us and make uh, hunting a lot easier? And then eventually that idea uh, is going to be applied to plants and you will have sedentary style agriculture. This is going to be a major shift in terms of how people are going to be living their lives. Prior to this, you've got a pretty nomadic existence where people are going to be living in these caves and they're going to be exhausting then the local resources of their area. They're going to hunt and they're going to gather uh, out their area until, well, we need to move on because the, the game has moved on or, you know, the ecology needs a chance to kind of re well, replenish itself. And so they would move from various places, uh, very, uh, from place to various other places. They would, they would never have a totally permanent settlement. Well, you can't do that with agriculture. You need to stay and constantly tend the fields and the, uh, the flocks of animals that you've got. So all of a sudden now, you're going to stay in one spot, and you're going to accrue really a great deal of stuff. You're going to be moving into a permanent settlement, so you can have a bigger house, one that you don't have to knock down and drag with you, and also you can accumulate more technology because you don't have to worry about carrying it with you every few months or every few years, depending on how often uh, you would be moving. We're also going to see the development of pottery in the wheel because you're going to need to store items and you're going to have more large, heavy pieces of equipment or large, heavy amounts of foodstuffs that you're going to be carrying. So you take the potter's wheel, you turn it sideways, you throw an axle on it uh, and a few boards on top of that, and you got yourself a cart. And so that's what's going to come as a result uh, of this. Now, as we move out of the stone ages, we're going to be getting something new, and that is ages of metal. First of these is going to uh, be the Bronze Age, and humans begin to replace these stone tools with metal. Bronze is going to be the first one because, without boring you with a lot of technical details, um, making metal useful as tools isn't just uh, you know finding it in the ground and then getting it hot, right? And then it melts and you can cast it as whatever you want. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. There's a bit of a chemical process that goes along with it, and it turns out that bronze is the easiest one to find and make. And so anyway, uh, for those of you who have been in the band and you know the brass section, brass and bronze are pretty close together. So uh, you can smack somebody over the head with your trumpet but there's a pretty good chance you're going to leave a, a dent in the trumpet when you do that. And bronze is actually a lot like that. Uh, it's pretty useful. It's definitely an upgrade over the wood and stone tools uh, that it replaces. Uh, but it really creates a revolution in a lot of different areas of human life. It's going to revolutionize ag agriculture uh, because you're going to be able to use it uh, use these metal implements to uh, plow up more ground much more efficiently. You're going to create uh, a much more efficient system of tools for clearing land, uh, for uh, planting crops. And so what that means is you're going to have more food. More food for less amount of effort, that's going to equal more people. Those are going to revolutionize warfare. Your army has bronze uh, shields and swords and armor, and the other guys have sticks and stones. Yeah, they're going to lose. <laughs> uh, your guys are going to win, their guys are going to lose. And uh, it is going to be a pretty obvious disparity in terms of military technology. We're also going to see as we're going to revolutionize trade, especially when we start, when we start talking about uh, large-scale ships being built of composite pieces. Uh, ancient watercraft had been around basically since people figured out that wood floats. Typically, the way that you would do this, uh, the biggest ship that you could have is pretty much the biggest tree that you could find. You'd hollow it out. You'd kind of fire it under one side. You'd, you'd chop out the... Uh, you know, the parts. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, techniques that you could use, but generally speaking, that was about as big as you could get because there was no way to attach 
planks together except by the use of metal fasteners. Now when you have metal, you can all of a sudden create these much larger ships. You can go longer distance in rougher seas, carrying much more uh, goods and people. And so this is going to radically uh, alter the way that people transport themselves because water is going to be a little bit more reliable. So we've kind of set the stage. We've got people. We've got people that are living in settled uh, areas. But we don't necessarily have a civilization yet. And we need to talk very, very quickly about what civilization is because this is an important definition. When we, as historians and as social sciences, use this term civilized or civilization, uh, it actually has a fairly specific technical kind of meaning. Uh, we normally use that is to say, well, you know, you people that are in your, you're acting so uncouth, you say, well, you're uncivilized. You know, you used the wrong fork at dinner, you're uncivilized. That, you know, is a hyperbole, and it doesn't necessarily have a specific meaning. Right. Civilization is defined by five major categories that you've got to have uh, sort of checked off, and that is an evolution from an uncivilized to a civilized culture. Right? One, you need to have a large city that is the center of the social organization. So you've got a town, you got a few huts, that's not civilization. Okay? You've got to have a large city. It needs to be the center of the social organization for the surrounding area. Two, you need a highly stylized religion of some type that is so prevalent that it has a professional religious class. You've got people that the only job that they do is religion, that they serve that for the community. Three, it needs to be large enough and well organized enough so it has a government that has uh, enough size to need a bureaucracy. So you can't just have one guy sort of wander around town and see everything in a day and go, okay, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. You need a bureaucracy that reports to higher levels of government that controls not only the functions of daily life, but also the military of the state. Evidence of social development of classes of wealthy, middle, and poor people. So you've got variegated divisions of labor that you're going to need. Five, you need to have some kind of intellectual advances such as writing, art, architecture, etc. that give evidence that you're making strides with this. Now, you can find evidence of this uh, right around the same time, China, India, Peru, all around the world, but most importantly, you're going to find this first in the Fertile Crescent. That's going to be this that we'll be dealing with uh, initially. So, <clears throat> you can see why this is called the Fertile Crescent. This is much of what is now Southeast uh, or Southwest Asia and Northeast Africa and sort of Southeastern, almost Southeastern Europe. But this is where we're going to be dealing with uh, first, and th at this point in world history, the Middle East isn't quite as dry and arid as it is today. It's a little bit wetter, but it's still, for the most part, more or less what you would, what you would recognize. So these areas that you're going to see are the areas that are going to stand in relief to the mostly dry and arid territories that surround them. And it makes a roughly sort of crescent-shaped uh, area. The two main legs that we're going to be talking about first is going to be the Mesopotamia leg. It's this river system of the Tigris and Euphrates, Tigris and Euphrates and their tributaries that is going to be the first thing that we're going to talk about. And then we'll deal with the Nile River uh, Valley here. And then this connecting piece that is going to be uh, the Levant, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, that instead of river system, a single river system that is going to uh, water the region, it's actually going to be uh, the rainfall from the Mediterranean that's going to be falling in the, uh, before you get into the rain shadow <coughs> of the hills here, uh, that's going to leave this strip along the coast, and so that connects the two legs and it gives us this crescent uh, kind of shape. So the first one here is going to be Mesopotamia, and as I mentioned, it's the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. This is the uh, Greek term meso, middle, and potamia, right, uh, land, uh, water, right, which is the land between the waters. This is what the, the, the Greek historians call it, so the name has kind of stuck. Now, Sumer is going to be the name of the first large-scale civilization, at least of the Western world, if not of the entire world, and there's a little bit of debate on this one, right? And one of the things that you've got to have in order to have a civilization is a surplus of agriculture, a surplus of food. People have to be making more food than they themselves and their family can eat. And so then you say, what are you going to do with the surplus? Well, we're going to sell it. Well, who's going to buy it? If everybody's farming and if everybody's making more than they can eat themselves, then there's nobody's going to buy it. So what happens is some people are then going to pull themselves out of the agricultural business and they're going to say, okay, well, I will take the leftover food because you're making it and you don't need it all and I will build houses, or I will work on technology, or I will build roads, or whatever. And so you've got that in division of labor. So you've got to have a surplus of agriculture where the farmer is getting to be so efficient that he can feed more people than himself and his family. 
So the way that they're able to do this in Mesopotamia is harnessing the overflow of these rivers for irrigation by the use of canals and ditches. In fact, uh, this had been going on for so long that a lot of people think that the reason the Tigris and the Euphrates flow together now is because of all the ditches and canals that ran between them that eventually they kind of merged together. But originally they may have gone uh, out to the sea separately or at least they joined you know, right before they got to the ocean instead of where they do uh, now. That is neither here nor there, <clears throat> but it does give you an idea of kind of how much canalization would have gone in for uh, agriculture. And so what that means is you're able to dump this water onto what would normally be infertile territory, water it, use it for agricultural fields, uh, and it's going to make arable land and thus help with the surplus of agriculture. Here's a picture at the bottom right uh, of one of these uh, canals that's in existence in Mesopotamia that some people think have been in, in, in almost constant use for 5,000 years. Now the cities themselves that get constructed here in Mesopotamia, right, Sumer initially, they're going to be large with these large ziggurat temples uh, in the center. You can see an example of this from a, a video game that I had been playing for a while. Um, this is in its ruined state, but still it gives you an idea of how large the, the city structure is and how tall the temple is in a three-dimensional kind of way. The city, of course, is going to be made of mud bricks. They've got a lot of sand, they can bring in some water, they've got a lot of sunlight to heat it up, so mud bricks seems like a good way to go. Now, the Sumerian government is headed by the king. You've got a monarchy which has top-down control of both the military and the civil functions of the city-state. Now, when you look at these early governments, and especially when you start digging into the, the ancient kind of documents, it's a little hit or miss because you look at it and say, well, how does this guy get to be the king? Why is he in charge and not somebody else? Why not a council? Why not a democracy? Right? Those of us that, that like that kind of thing. Well, the concept that we see from the earliest uh, rationales, at least that we have on uh, hand, is the king held power because the gods of uh, Sumer wanted him to. It's for a pretty good argument, right? How come you're the king? Hey, God wants me to be king. Okay. Right? Um, the belief was that the king was descended from gods and that he was at least semi-divine himself. So that's, that's the rationale from it. You've got a pagan style uh, religion that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But the idea was that the king was uh, part of this religious system. And so you've got to do what they say, right? Now, it's, Sumer was the, the, the center of this city-state style of government, right? The city is the center of the government, right? And of the social organization. And it extends its authority out through the surrounding uh, farmlands all around it. So you're seeing that not only is it the city, that's the, the, the sort of the government, but however far out those bounds can go that they can defend and that they can maintain control over, that is uh, where the extent of the, the uh, city-state is going to go. So the city holds both this political as well as economic power because the farmland area is going to have to come into the city to sell its surplus of agriculture and then trade that for the goods that the city can produce. Shoes, tools, clothing. Right, etc. And they're also going to be using the, the river systems for trade with other settlements. So this is how this is going to happen. And I like the picture here, the artist rendition, to give you an idea of what Sumer would have looked like uh, when it was uh, really in its heyday. To give you an idea of kind of how heavily settled uh, these areas were. So what about intellectual advancements? This is one of the things that you've got to have. Sumer gives us one of the great ones that some of you may be doing right now while you're watching the video series, and that's taking notes. And that's the first written language, which is cuneiform. Cuneiform starts out as these clay tablets that you would use the ends of these reeds uh, and various other shapes to kind of press these symbols into the clay tablets that are then fired and you have a nice permanent record. And it revolutionizes uh, record keeping first. If you, when you go back and we crack the code for cuneiform, and if you read through uh, most of them, especially the earliest ones, they, they read sort of like uh, the receipts that you get at the grocery store or you know, the, the, that you get from the accountant's office, which is uh, we have this many cows over here, we have this many you know, tons of grain over there probably this many chickens or whatever, right? Uh, it's just a tally of, well, this is how much we have and this is what we're doing, right? And so when, you, when you're dealing with numbers, and this gives us an idea that these guys are dealing with numbers that are too big to keep in your head, they've got too much stuff, you've got to have some way to record it, right? You've got to have some way to write it down. It's also going to eventually be applied to uh, history. The idea is that you're going to record, you know, uh, what's going on, what has happened in the past, you're able to record family histories, you'll even be able to then start interjecting art and religion and things like that into it. And of course, it's going to revolutionize humanity. The idea that we can uh, preserve something in an immutable form, and so we don't have to remember it physically, we can go back and look at it later, is one of the great uh, changes in all of humanity, right? 
We're also going to see that Sumerian architecture is going to make some huge strides forward and it's going to give us the arch, hence the term architecture or ar architecture. Why do they say it like that? Anyway, uh, these mud bricks and all these materials are much stronger by using the arc. Uh, the arch, and then you've got the capstone. You get the keystone that basically dis uh, disperses all the weight along the length of the bricks of the arch, rather than trying to make a square lintel, which then all the weight comes down in the center and it's much more likely to break. The reason that this is important is you can now have large stone structures with windows, with doors, and they're not going to crumble. And so now all of a sudden, instead of these relatively small, lightweight uh, houses and structures, you can have very large stone structures that are these big defensible positions. And this is going to make a major change uh, from the way that architecture had worked before. Eventually, cuneiform will help and pitch in and produce this very rich literature. A good example of this is the story of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was a semi-legendary king of uh, Sumer. He went on to have these sort of adventures, and he fought off these guys. And then uh, it reads, actually, Gilgamesh reads a lot like the play, uh, like a screenplay for an action movie. I'm surprised that there hasn't been like the epic of Gilgamesh made yet, maybe soon. Uh, the gods get mad at him for his uh, pride. They send down Enkidu, one of their own number, to fight him, and they have this big sort of fight that rages across the rooftops of Sumer. Eventually, Gilgamesh defeats him, and after these two guys fight, they become best buds. And then the gods get mad at Enkidu and Gilgamesh because of their flouting of this, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their excessive pride. They send out these sort of mythical bulls, and these, these flying bulls come down to wreck the city, and so. Uh, NQ and Gilgamesh, they fight them off together. Like I said, it's an action movie. You know, it's really, really good. Uh, as Gilgamesh ages, he realizes that even he will have to die, and so he goes off. He meets the uh, Sumerian equivalent of Noah. It's this guy sitting by the river who's apparently survived the great flood. Uh, and he asks him, what's the secret of immortality? He says, you've got to swim down to the bottom of the river and get the, the, the grass that grows there. And it, if you can get it, it'll, it'll be immortality for you. And just as he swims down and he's about to grasp it, this snake that is sent by the gods snatches away from him. So Gilgamesh dies, right, before he can attain immortality. Who knew you could get all that from a bunch of stuff just pressed into clay tablets, okay? So <clears throat> this is Gilgamesh in action. For those of you who thought I made that whole, you know, he made pals with Enkidu and wrestled bulls while he was naked on top of the uh, Sumerian palace. This is what they recorded with this, all right? The Sumerian religion, which I mentioned in Dribs and Drabs, uh, was actually pretty well formed. It was, start, it was very highly stylized. They had certain rituals. They had certain belief systems. Uh, and it had a very large class of professional priests. Now, natural disasters and then also bountiful natural successes, such as bumper crops, uh, large... Uh, you know, calving periods where you got a whole bunch of extra cows that didn't die. All of this was assumed to be the work of the gods. The concept that these guys had was that their various pagan gods uh, of their cosmos were seen as the real owners of the city-state. They were the ones that had formed the earth, they were the ones that had formed all this stuff, and they were the ones that actually owned it, and the, basically the humans were renting it from them, and as long as uh, they did what was right in the eyes of the gods, they were paying their rent off uh, by being good people. And so some of it was uh, they had to do certain rites and rituals. Some of it was they had to do some work, and they definitely had to take care of the priestly class. So this gives you an idea of why the Ziggurat Temple is the center of the city with some sacrifice rituals uh, performed on the top, especially you're going to see uh, bull worship and you know, the slaughtering of the bulls and things like that uh, with what they're doing uh, there. Well, one of the problems that Sumer has as an expansive city-state is it has no real natural boundaries. I mean, to the east and to the west, you've got relatively open terrain, and then you've got the river system that runs, for the most part, north and south. And so as a result of that, it doesn't have you know, mountains, it doesn't have oceans uh, that can keep out invaders. So Sumer was often attacked and it was often conquered, right? One of the things, though, that is going to happen here is you've got a great deal of strength of the Sumerian culture itself. And this is going to be one of our first windows of conquest. One of the things that we'll be talking a lot about in World History One is conquerors, how they conquer, and then what do you do next? Because it turns out that conquest is actually pretty easy. You get a big army, especially if you get one with a good commander, they can take over a lot of places. You can really kick a lot of butt with a good army that has a good commander. And then, okay, we've taken this place over. Now what? Unless you kill everybody, right? you're going to have to adapt to the fact that, okay, you're taking these people over, now what are you going to do with them? Well, in a lot of ways, Sumer often conquers their conquerors, not militarily, but culturally. Because a lot of, Sumer, uh, a lot of Sumer's cultural heritage is going to survive because many of these people, they come into Sumer and they realize that Sumer's really got a lot of stuff figured out. 
we're going to adapt ourselves to Sumerian culture, and they're going to uh, subsume these Sumerian lifeways as their own. Now, the best example of this is Hammurabi, right? Hammurabi is a Babylonian of the old Babylonian Empire, right? He takes over most of Mesopotamia, and he uses cuneiform as one of the best, and really one of the first, legal codes, right? This law of Hammurabi, to give you an example of this, stressed equality in terms of punishment, but not necessarily between citizens. It still made an important distinction whether or not you were the nobility, one set of laws applied to you, or whether you were a commoner, in which case a different set of laws apply to you. But a good example is an eye for an eye, meaning if somebody you know, causes you damage and they poke out your eye, you don't get to get mad and kill them, because that's not fair. And while it seems pretty rough you know, to say, well, I'm going to poke your eye out now, but it's like, no, there has to be equality. This is something that, uh, even in cases of estoppel today in modern law, you say, well, if they did $5,000 worth of damage to you, then they have to pay you back $5,000. There's got to be equality uh, in terms of this. Now, like I said, Hammurabi, eh, not so much equality between people, but the idea that you're going to use Sumerian cultural patterns, the idea of uh, a, a government and a bureaucracy that's going to extend out where you're going to use cuneiform to do your legal system, and you write it down so it doesn't change and everybody knows what it is, it's a good use of culture. All right? <coughs> And the next light we're going to talk about is we're going to shift from the eastern end of the Fertile Crescent to the western end, and that is the ancient Egyptian civilization. Right? And it's situated along the Nile River. Right? You're going to have a lot of cities. This is really, in, in many ways, especially the Old Kingdom, one of the, the, the greatest of the civilizations that we're going to talk about. You've got immense architecture. You've got a very well-developed uh, religion, and it's extremely longevous. The civilization is going to last in that form uh, for over 2,000 years. It'll, it'll eventually evolve uh, when we get to the, the Greek period and when we get to the Roman period, and when we get to the Islamic period. So the basis of Egypt's rise is going to be this rich farmland that's created by the flooding of the Nile River every September. And what happens is when the Nile, normally we think of floods as something bad. You, know, you turn on the news and say, oh, there's flooding there, and they show people like going down to the post office in their boat or whatever, and they talk about their house that you know, has drifted away or, or whatever. You know? uh, but flooding at this point was usually a good thing, definitely for the Egyptians, because what it did was it brought down a whole bunch of fresh water, uh, that would then spill the banks and it would go out into this area that would normally be desert. Instead, you get this you know, lush, uh, well-watered area, and it also is going to bring down soil from the highlands that is then going to deposit rich, rich uh, uh, soil that could then be used for farmland. And it is such a good flood that you're going to be able to create an immensity of agricultural surplus from it. And in fact, in years where the flood was meager or essentially not present, then you got problems, right? you got famine that is going to result as a result of this. Okay, So the surplus of food is so extensive that it allows these people to go through the normal sort of civilizing steps. You have, they're going to be able to form these little villages and these towns, and the towns are going to form themselves into cities. These cities eventually are going to, through a series of wars and political consolidations, and, and we don't have to go through all of this, but they're going to form themselves into two major kingdoms. All right? You've got Upper and Lower Egypt. Now, because the Nile flows from south to north, you have... Uh, Upper is actually in the south, and lower, which is the delta area, it is in the north, right? Upper, south, lower, north, right? <clears throat> King Minish, or somebody else, depending on kind of how you want to read the, the history, right? But a lot of people think that King Minish is the guy that unites the kingdom in, uh, and unites the two kingdoms into one kind of empire, and it's often referred to as uh, the old kingdom as a result of that. And so, in a lot of ways, he's kind of the first pharaoh, although the term pharaoh doesn't come until much, much uh, later. So we've got three major time periods that I want to talk about with Egypt to give you an idea of what's going on sort of chronologically. It's a very uneven distribution in terms of time. Almost all of it, most of it, is going to take place under the Old Kingdom, and then we'll see the Middle Kingdom, and then we'll have the New Kingdom. Right? During this Old Kingdom, this is when we're going to see the building of many of the massive scale pieces of architecture, such as the pyramids and the Sphinx. And of course, this is going to be uh, built upon the backs, literally, of massive conscripted slave labor. Uh, a lot of people think that not only was slave labor used to build the pyramids, but in fact the pyramids were used to help build Egypt because you've got all of these different settlements that are all strung out on a string. And many cases are going to be very, very far uh, away from one another. But when they're brought in with these labor levies, they're going to be living in these slave labor camps. They're going to be working on these kind of things all day. And this is going to help acculturate all these people from various uh, geographic zones all along the Nile River into one kind of national uh, cultural unit. 
At least that's the theory. And I think it holds a lot of water because this is a shared experience and of course it's only going to encourage trade contacts between various uh, other people once these guys go home and the slave labor season uh, is over. We're going to see that trade is extremely plentiful because of the artery of the Nile River. So you're going to be able to ship goods and food and people back and forth using uh, the Nile River. The kings are going to become, and I've got pharaohs in kind of quotes because like I said, the actual term doesn't get uh, put into use until much, much later. But for what you and I would recognize as a pharaoh, which is the political, military, and religious leader, that is during this period, right? The bureaucracy is also extremely well established and runs the entire kingdom because, as I mentioned, geographically, the old kingdom is extremely spread out. You go from the delta all the way up to the highlands of the south over a number of cataracts. Uh, in the Nile River, and there's no way for any kind of central authority to be everywhere in any kind of reasonable amount of time. So you've got to have trusted sub-level bureaucrats that you can write to, send in information to, and say, okay, this is what we want you to do, and you've got to trust them to be able to execute the central will of government uh, in some of these remote areas. Well, <clears throat> you have a lot of power, you have a lot of money, and when that happens, this is going to be a recurring theme, uh, so you may want to underline this, you're going to have people that are going to fight for it. Right? You got a lot of power, you got a lot of money, people are going to fight for it. And what we're going to have is a series of civil wars. Many of these dynastic changes uh, that take place during the Old Kingdom, in fact, take place because somebody killed somebody else and they took over. So when you have continual civil wars, though, you're going to bloodlet amongst yourself and you are going to reduce your ability to resist outsiders. Now, for much of this period, Egypt doesn't really have a whole lot to worry about because to the west, you've got, for the most part, open desert. To the north, you've got the ocean, and large-scale amphibious invasions aren't really a thing yet, right? To the south, you've got the Nubians, which are kind of a hassle, I suppose, but you're not actually worried that they're necessarily going to come in and take over. Uh, and then to the east, you only have this narrow little corridor that connects you to uh, the rest of Asia through the Wadi of Egypt, and that's pretty defensible. Well, it turns out that there are so many civil wars take place that eventually Egypt's ability to defend itself, especially through, this, uh, the, through the Wadi of Egypt, is going to be diminished. And so we're going to have the Hyksos, this sort of wandering tribe of warriors, are going to invade from Asia in large-scale numbers, and they're going to take over the Egyptians. And so for the first time, you're going to have non-Egyptians running Egypt, and the Egyptians themselves are forced to be subordinate to them because they've got... Uh, better weapons technology. Well, over the course of the decades of uh, the Hyksos rule, the Egyptians, while they can't necessarily mount a very effective uh, organized defense against them, they are going to learn from these guys because they're going to serve in their army, they're going to learn these fighting techniques, they're going to uh, absorb you know, weapons technology such as the chariot, the composite bow, uh, and how you employ these on the battlefield, and eventually they're going to rise up and they're going to kick these uh, guys out of the country. Egypt then is going to reestablish itself under the new kingdom, right? And they are going to realize that there's a much wider world, and for both military and economic reasons, you're going to see them beginning to look outward. And they're going to begin conquering many of their neighbors, and they're going to demand tribute from them for protection. When you watch a lot of those mafia movies and they say, hey, you know, you know it was protection money, it's pretty much the same thing, right? The Egyptians say, oh, you're our allies, and oh, we'll protect you, and you give us the you know, resources, you know, money, and wood and gold and whatever, right? Whatever it is you want, you know, food from these guys, and we'll protect you. Of course, they're also going to protect you from themselves. So you rebel against them, and they come and they get you, right? So <clears throat> the trade networks during this period is going to be uh, pretty lavish and widespread. Uh, many think that they are going to extend all the way out to Europe and to India uh, in this regard. But as these guys get wealthier and wealthier and, and more and more powerful, we're going to see civil wars again are going to erupt. They're going to weaken Egypt. They're eventually conquered by the Persians. And then, of course, the Persians are eventually going to be conquered by the Greeks. And so you get back to where uh, much of what we talk about with ancient Egypt is really going to start being fundamentally transformed uh, into something else. Now, what about Egyptian society? All right? So if we look at the overall sort of course of history. When you look down on a day-to-day -day kind of basis, one of the things that you'll see is a pretty strong and uh, rigid hierarchy that's divided into three classes. One, you've got the upper class, you've got the nobility, that's people that are related to uh, the king, related to the pharaoh, and then, of course, uh, some of the other noble families that will be uh, with them as well. But then also you have the priestly class. You've got pagan religion, a number of temples, they all have to have priestly people that are in charge of these. And, of course, it shouldn't surprise us that many of these priestly people are going to come from the caste of the nobility. So the upper class is pretty well set. Middle, you've got a pretty small middle group uh, at this point. Not too many, but these are the people that are enriched by trade. 
merchants, warehouse people, business guys, things like that. For the most part, the overwhelming majority of people are going to be lowered. The lower group, that's going to be the farmers uh, and the slaves. Now, all of these guys were ruled by this god king that uh, eventually would be known by the title of Pharaoh. It's actually a Greek term, means like master of palace or something like that. But this idea that you know Pharaoh uh, owns all this land, runs the religion, uh, this is uh, what we're going to see here. Not only is he the king, but he's also the head religious figure. He's assumed to be semi-divine. And so when we look at uh, Egyptian religion, it's a really, really interesting uh, view into a very well-formed and interesting sort of theological um, perception of how the world and the cosmos works. Now, the Egyptians, for almost the entirety of their existence, are polytheistic, right? or the ancient Egyptians were. And they worship these many gods of sun, water, rain, and their chief god was the dead. What's really interesting for a lot of civilizations around them is their contribution of an extremely well-formed idea about the immortality of souls and an afterlife. Uh, the <clears throat> chief god that they had that they really all looked to, uh, sort of forward to meeting was Osiris, and he's the god of the dead. And so you can see our scene here, uh, this is a, uh, not unlike Dante's Inferno, except it's done by an ancient Egyptian, and there's our poet who's being introduced to Osiris. But the, the entire concept was that your heart would be weighed on a scale, uh, and on the other side would be a feather. And your good deeds would make your heart lighter, and your bad deeds would make your heart sink. And if your heart was lighter than a feather, then you would be granted goodness in the afterlife, and I guess you get to go and hang out with Osiris for a while. And if not, there was a giant crocodile monster that would eat you. So, you know, you could spend eternity as a crocodile maneuver, right? So, <clears throat> as a result of this belief system, the Egyptians, they mummify their dead. They provided for goods of their afterlife. Uh, you can find this most lavishly in the tombs of the kings, but even on kind of the lower level, even people at the bottom end of the scale had sort of basic burial rites uh, for a much more humble afterlife uh, for them as well. Now, what's interesting is we do have a lot of information, uh, uh, unwittingly, by Akhenaten, right, who experimented with this idea of monotheism. He said, well, there's really going to be only one god if you go far enough up, and it's really it's the sun god. Uh, but the priests of all these other religions, or of all these other gods of the Egyptian religion, wait a minute, that means we're out of work. And a lot of people think that they uh, engineered an assassination, and after a brief period of time, they are going to reinstitute polytheism uh, into the Egyptian religion. Now, the, the Egyptians also make a number of important intellectual advances, right? And uh, they're going to develop writing, but not in the way of inventing necessarily. Uh, anything new. They did have hieroglyphics, and they also have hieratic, which is a sort of a more cursive-like uh, script. But they're going to be the ones that are going to develop more of what you write on. Paper, essentially, uh, is going to be developed from the papyrus reed, where you crush it, you powder it, and then you spread it out as uh, reeds. And they're going to write stories and their histories in their hieroglyphics. And it's all there in, in the parts that are preserved. Uh, but it was not until, finally, the uh, discovery and deciphering of the Rosetta Stone in the early 1800s that finally people were able to read this and all of this uh, you know, rich sort of cultural legacy gets unlocked. These guys were great at math and engineering. They're going to allow the Egyptians to build these you know, enormous uh, cities, structures, pyramids. you got the use of hydrostatic pressure to get these things you know, evenly to come together. They're going to line up the major constellation formations, the construction of very accurate calendars. They're also going to invent the modern party, right? They invent glass, they invent beer, right? Uh, they invent the Ark of the Covenant. Well, not exactly, right? Uh, for those of you who wonder why the Egyptians here are hanging out with what looks to be the Hebrew Ark of the Covenant is when the Hebrews eventually escape and they make an ark, they use Egyptian art forms uh, for what they're going to be doing. And so Egyptian art is, of course, going to be important for uh, a lot of reasons and would hang around for a long time afterwards. So. So that's the end of part one. Uh, next time when we get together, uh, we'll be dealing with that middle prong of the, uh, the Fertile Crescent.